Well, what I think is interesting about this way of understanding the crucifixion story is that for the person hearing, for me, it created a lot of uh, condemnation, a lot of guilt. We end up with this picture of this God who is basically a judge. He, he would love us, but he can't because of the sin that we've committed. So the, the first posture that God takes towards me when I first sort of meet God in this story is one of anger, one of wrath, one of condemnation and judgment. And that God isn't approachable. If that's who we understand God to be, then, then it's really hard to love God. It's, it's scary to believe in that sort of a God, this God who's basically set against you, who's wrathful and who's angry against you. It, it doesn't matter, I think, whether you're a Christian or not. Here's where the fights start. 
Because today, we've, re we've reduced love to sentimentality. We think that love is what happens in romantic comedies when two particularly handsome leads meet at a Starbucks through some wild set of goofy circumstances, and then they fall in love. And while infatuation, or if we were to be kinder, puppy love, is a wonderful, fun thing, it's light years from what the scriptures teach that love is. Uh, Jesus himself defined this Trinitarian self-giving love, this love that's not at all anything like infatuation. In the Gospel of John, he said this, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. The love that is the core of who God is is this, this giving of the self for the good of the other person. It's relationship, it's self-sacrifice. That's why in 1 John, the writer said that God shows how much he loves us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life for him. Love is not that we love God, it's that God loved us by sending his son as a sacrifice to take away our sin. God shows us love by giving himself to and for us. And it's, it's that self-giving that's at the heart of the Christian understanding of the Trinity. That God is the single being that exists as three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And each of the persons is always giving themselves to and for the other two persons, always honoring them, always glorifying them, always looking to them instead of themselves. So the question we should ask then at this point, kind of take time out and say, well, what does that have to do with what was happening on the cross? Well, lots of us have heard that on the cross the Trinity was broken. We've heard that somehow the, uh, and, and there are plenty of pastors and theologians who will explicitly say this. They will actually say that the Trinity was broken, and that and this is the only kind of picture that's ever happened, and things like that. But even, even people who won't come out and explicitly say that will say that God turned his back on Jesus, that he abandoned Jesus, that he forsook Jesus, that he denied Jesus, and that implies this, this, this tear, this breaking of relationship between the Father and the Son. But according to Trinitarian, understanding of God as divine love, that, that can't happen. No person in the Godhead can quit being God, and none of them can ever forsake or abandon the other person, because if they did, they, they quit loving and therefore quit being God. Be, because God is fundamentally relational, God can't ever quit being a relationship with God. A God who isn't relating isn't God. It'd be like trying to talk about a square circle. Like it, It's just, there's, there's no such thing. So to, so to say that on the cross somehow Jesus quit being God or somehow the, the Trinity was broken is actually to say that basically God quit being God for some moments. And that's something that no Christian has ever said or would want to say. And that plays directly into the second important point that I'm going to talk about, which is the doctrine of divine simplicity. Okay, now, this, this doesn't mean that God is easy to understand, obviously, right? We've already figured that out in the ten minutes we've been talking about. Essentially, what divine simplicity is talking about is the oneness of God or the unity of God. It says that God is singular. God is never divided. God is never conflicted. That there's never tension within the Godhead. That the members of the Trinity are never in conflict or in tension with each other. And even that God's attributes always work in perfect harmony. Uh, the, the daily prayer in the Old Testament that the, the Jewish people call the Shema even talks about this oneness. They say, it says, Here... O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that the oneness of God is something that's, that's foundational for, for both the Jewish and the Christian people. And if you ever needed proof that the God of the Scriptures is not a God that we made in our own image as some other people claim, I would say that it's this doctrine that is the proof. And because can you imagine ever being totally, perfectly united inside of yourself? Can you ever imagine not being conflicted, not torn by conflicting desires? I mean, to be human is to be this dense, complicated creature. 